Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So this is the beginning of our fourth year for the member site. We started July 29th of 2013. And I just want to thank all the members who've come along for the ride. Uh, it's not the biggest site in the world. Uh, I apologize for the recent problems we've had because of the subscription renewals. But it's a, it's a nice community. I really enjoy it because there's a lot of input and uh, a lot of people contribute and so that's just been a very enjoyable thing for me to have people that I can talk to who have who are like-minded not exactly like-minded don't have to agree with me on everything we don't have to agree about everything but somewhat like-minded so just once again thanks to everybody for supporting us it's been very enjoyable and uh, hopefully it's going to be more exciting in the future now I want to take you to the silver chart and you can see that the the trend line that we're looking at here is is very strong it's very well established uh, it's had quite a number of touch points on it you can see it's even got those little tick down where you get let's see if we can sell it down below there see if we can crash it uh, sort of ones which fail which means that it's a strong uptrend line and then it just uh, matches up and keeps rising. So clearly it's trying to build that sort of pennant formation, trying to break out to that, I think 26 is going to be the next level. Uh, on the long term, of course, the monthly we know we're not nearly back yet, although we're starting to get a very sharp slope in this red line ascension. Probably not rivaled, I would say definitely not rivaled by anything except for this, which was a phenomenal breakout. Boy, can you imagine if we followed that up from, the, from below the zero line? So we're still waiting for the monthly. Now the weekly has kind of spiked up. It's rounding off a little bit. Nothing like we had back in the 2010 run-up, but it is a little bit overbought. And then, of course, the daily it's kind of in overbought territory but it's correcting back down looks like it's very strong on the daily it looks like it wants to turn up you can see that but the price is still high so I would say the weekly looks a little bearish the monthly and the daily are very very bullish and uh, the, the two hour I think is the one with the trend line is very very bullish so overall bullish so I wanted to take you to the debt to the penny. This is one I frequently cover. And uh, we're, we're approaching the doubling of the debt under the current administration. Now, uh, I took this back to the swearing in of George Bush Jr. And we know he did eight years and pretty much we had a doubling of the debt there. You can see it when he was sworn in, I think it was the 19th or 20th of January, 2001, we were about 5.7 trillion in debt. And then when we scroll all the way down to when Obama was sworn in, which was the 20th of uh, January 2009, you can see that at that point we were about 10.6. So not quite a doubling. So we go from there to where we are now. We were at 10.6 trillion in national debt. A doubling would be 21.2 trillion. And you can see we're at 20 or we're at 19.4. Yeah, so there, there's a ways to go, but it's possible. Anything's possible, especially if we had a financial crisis. We saw that when we had the 2008 financial crisis. Even though Obama had a pretty big number when he got in, it actually kind of blew up right before that because of the financial crisis, TARP bailouts, and things like that. So starting in that fall when that crisis happened, it, it began to brew in the summer. And then in the fall, uh, you can see that the national debt just took off there right up through $10 trillion and continuing to rise uh, until when Obama got in. So it took a big blast off right before uh, between the presidential time periods, which makes perfect sense because we know that we have an irresponsible Congress, we have irresponsible politicians, we have irresponsible presidents, and one thing that they would they love to do is to have 
time periods where none of them are accountable for anything, lame duck periods, and and that's a time when they can the spending can go crazy, the debt ceiling can be lifted, etc. Just so they can avoid being held accountable. So let's take a look at this latest Jeff Nielsen article. Now I, I don't usually read entire articles, but this one's so good. This is a this is something that I've harped on ever since I heard Jeff Nielsen first mention it. He may not have been the first person who came up with the idea, but he was the first person who explained it to me in a way that I could understand and that makes perfect sense. And that is that the fact that there are virtually no primary silver mines is proof that silver is manipulated, period, end of story. Now, people in the comments are going to disagree with it. I, I don't disagree with it. It's very clear to me, especially when we're talking about an 80, 70 to 80 to 1 silver to gold ratio. It It's proof positive in my mind that the, the silver market is manipulated and the most manipulated. So let's read this. Understanding the dynamics and differences between the silver mining industry and the gold mining industry is simple. It's all in the numbers. What is somewhat more challenging is to decipher what these numbers really mean. A reader recently made a valid observation in endeavoring to explain the current extremely skewed gold-silver price ratio. Historically, for more than 4,000 years, this ratio hovered around 15 to 1. Over the last 100 plus years, This price ratio has exploded at times exceeding a ratio of 80 to 1. It was noted by a reader that on a cost per ounce basis today, it is more expensive for the mining companies presently in operation to mine their gold deposits versus the relative cost per ounce for companies presently in operation to mine their silver. Thus, according to this reasoning, gold silver prices should be skewed to such an absurd degree. It seems like a reasonable argument. Indeed, at first glance, the logic seems almost irrefutable. It is only when we step back and view precious metals mining from a broader, longer-term perspective that we see that what this observation actually proves is something quite the opposite to its surface appearance. First, some context. Gold and silver are deemed to be precious metals because in relative terms they are much, much more scarce than industrial base metals such as lead, zinc, iron, and even copper. However, gold in particular is found in most regions of the world in varying concentrations. Silver, for for reasons known only to the geologists, is more abundant in the New World, North and South America. On average, silver exists at a 17 to 1 ratio versus gold in the Earth's crust. Humanity has mined these metals for well over 4,000 years. Until approximately a century ago, the world has always gotten most of its silver from silver mines. Similarly, we get most of our iron from iron mines, we get most of our copper from copper mines, and we get most of our gold from gold mines. This is elementary logic. We require metals for industrial purposes, or in the case of gold and silver, they're also used for money and jewelry. The most efficient means to acquire these metals is to search for where they are found in greatest abundance and then mine those deposits. Then suddenly, a little over a hundred years ago, the dynamics of precious metals mining began to change. For the first time in more than four millennia, while the world continued to get the vast majority of its gold from gold mining, we began to get a smaller and smaller percentage of our silver from silver mines. Instead, we began getting a greater and greater percentage of our silver as a byproduct of other mining. Many of the world's richest ore deposits are polymetallic, meaning the ore being mined contains several metals in significant percentages. Thus, the world began to get more and more of its silver from, in particular, copper mines and lead zinc mines. Eventually, we started to get a majority of our silver via this byproduct production. For the past several decades, we've gotten at least 75% of our annual supply of silver as byproducts, and often more than 80%. How and why did this happen? It's all in the numbers. And you can see here, this is the very, very famous silver price in 1998 dollars chart. Uh, going, this, this chart goes from 1344 to 1998. And it also has, in gold, is the gold-silver ratio. So this is, th- this is the main chart 
that he's going to be citing. Look at the chart above, and what do we see starting a little over 100 years ago? We see the price of silver in real dollars start to go lower and lower and lower and lower. The reason for this steadily falling price of silver 100 years ago is the same as the reason for the steadily falling price in recent years, price manipulation. Those readers wanting or needing more education in this area would be well served by reviewing Charles Savoy's chronology titled Silver Stealers. Putting aside the reason for the relentless decline in the price of silver, the effect of this relentless price destruction was obvious. It became more and more expensive to mine silver because of the perpetually declining price. Thus, one by one, the world's silver mines began to close. When prices hit their despicable bottom in this century of manipulation, the banking oligarchs had driven the price of silver to a 600-year low in real dollars. The result of this systemic crime was that well over 90% of the world's silver mines were driven out of business and the mines were mothballed or simply abandoned. As the world's silver mines were driven out of business by the perennial price manipulation of the banking crime syndicate, a greater and greater percentage of the world's silver came as a byproduct of other mining by default. This is the only reason why we do not continue to get most of our silver from silver mines, just as humanity has done for more than 4,000 years. Obviously, this is a dynamic which could, can be reversed. If the price of silver began to steadily rise and even approached its fair market value, we would see this trend completely reverse. More and more silver mines would go into production. A steadily rising percentage of our silver would come from silver mines, and soon the vast majority equilibrium and sanity would be restored to precious metals mining. The price of silver is no longer below $4 an ounce as it was at the original 600 year low. Today, after a slight recovery, the price of silver teeter-totters around the $20 an ounce level. Many readers may look at this elevated nominal price for silver and ask why we have not seen this dynamic already start to reverse. There are two facets in response to such thinking. First of all, if silver was priced at a historic norm versus the cost of labor, a fair market price for silver today would be somewhere around $1,000 an ounce. Some readers may choose other metrics for estimating their own fair market value, but by any rational calculation, we would be dealing with some three-digit number as a price for silver. Relative to those numbers, the current $20 an ounce price is pathetically low, which is why most of the world's silver mines remain closed, and many large deposits of silver at lower grades remain unmined. The dearth of silver mining is further evidentiary proof that silver is grossly underpriced, and proof that this underpricing can only be the result of price manipulation. As noted in a previous commentary, it has now been established that the silver market has a supply deficit for roughly 30 consecutive years, if not longer. This is unprecedented throughout history anywhere else in the world's spectrum of commodities. What is supposed to happen when any commodity experiences a supply deficit? Elementary supply-demand analysis provides us with the answer. The price rises. This rise in price discourages demand while it stimulates supply because it becomes more profitable to produce. The price continues to rise until the deficit is eliminated and equilibrium is restored. The economics term for this principle is price discovery. This is what happens in all legitimate markets. The fact that this has not happened, the fact that we have not had real price discovery in the silver market for three decades, is absolutely conclusive proof of systemic price manipulation. There could never be any legitimate explanation for the complete absence of price discovery in any market for three decades. There is only one reason why it has been possible to sustain this price manipulation at such an extreme level for three decades and more. It is because as precious metals, both gold and silver, tend to be conserved, thus over a period of more than 4,000 years, humanity accumulated tremendous stockpiles of gold and silver how the oligarchs acquire control of much of these stockpiles and how silver remains is this how much silver remains is a matter subject matter for another discussion the bottom line is that it is only through bleeding these massive stockpiles onto the market year after year decade after decade that silver price manipulation could be sustained at a cost of 
decimating the global silver mining industry. The other reason why a $20 an ounce price for silver is not remotely sufficient to restore the world's silver mining industry can be seen by looking at the familiar chart below of the Bernanke helicopter drop. The point here should be obvious. After the most extreme episode of monetary dilution in any major nation in our modern history, in real dollars, today's $20 an ounce U.S. nominal price for silver is lower than the sub $4 an ounce nominal price which we had 20 years ago. In real dollars, the price of silver remains mired at a 600 year low. Yet we have some people referring to recent modest price action as a rally. The perversion here should be obvious to most readers even without the benefit of the preceding analysis. Ask the bankers or their media sycophants why we get most of our silver as a byproduct of other mining and you'll get some variation of the response that there are not enough high quality deposits of silver to support more silver mines. This is absurd. If there's not enough silver to support more silver mines, why do we continue to get the vast majority of the world's gold from gold mines, even though the price of gold is also manipulated lower to a lesser extent? As previously noted, silver is 17 times as abundant as gold. If it was gold, where most of the world's supply came as a byproduct, this might be rational because of gold's considerably greater scarcity. There can be no rational, legitimate explanation as to why we get most of our gold from gold mines, while the same is not true with silver. Price silver at $1,000 an ounce or price it at even $200 an ounce and keep it there in real dollars and we would see a return to sanity and legitimacy in precious metals mining. Once again, the world would get the vast majority of its silver from silver mines. The near extinction of silver mining around the world is absolutely conclusive evidentiary proof of the extreme sustained downward manipulation of the price of silver. Equally, if and when the world once again is getting most of its silver from silver mines, this will be evidentiary proof that silver is at or approaching its fair market value. Until we see this occur, we will continue to have irrefutable proof of the criminal price manipulation taking place in this sector. That's Jeff Nielsen. Excellent, excellent article. I couldn't agree more Silver is still the most manipulated commodity on the face of the earth. A $20 price, to me, yes, that is the equivalent. I showed you the national debt uh, since that price low in silver. Yes, uh, the national debt has gone up roughly fourfold, but silver's gone up fivefold. But if we start looking off balance sheet in other places, then I'm sure the increase uh, is at least as much or more than the price of silver. So. That's just a kind of back of the matchbook argument to show you that we're still hovering at those near $4 lows, 600 year price lows for silver. And uh, moving forward, I think we're going to see some explosive price action. And we'll talk to you next time.